I am going to now jump in. I like this. I like the Saturday thing. I like being cash. I like not feeling the pressure of work. Yes. Yeah. I should have. I should have no makeup. Should left my sweats on. Did you put on makeup? Just a little bit. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's dive into this and let's get through the content so we can get to the Q&A, which is going to be a lot of fun today. I know that. So I am going, oh, and we are fine. Webinar disasters. Let's get into it. So. It's really what? zoomed in on me. Is that just me? Uh, I, I'm not kidding you. Well, not I mean, it's not zoomed in on me, but your slide is zoomed in. No, oh, never slide? mind. It was me. It was my settings. Never mind. Okay. Well, you can Continue. you can mute your mic now, Jen. Oh, okay. Thanks, Steve. What to expect today? Steve being nasty to Jen. Other than that, we're going to go through webinar disasters. Are you talking again? <laughs> Why are you? I can still hear you. Well, because you're hear you here. Maybe they can't hear you on the on the feed. No, it's because I'm. It's Saturday and I'm being disruptive, so I'm going to mute okay. my microphone now. Goodbye, Jen. Keep auditing the chat. Be nice to everybody. Now, what to expect today? Webinar disasters. We've had two and a half weeks of interesting experiences in webinars. And I'm gonna we're gonna walk through them a little bit. What have we learned from them? And what can we take from that and apply that in so that we can deliver better webinars in the future? Um, and kind of pulling out of that information, what makes webinars so effective? I mean, why am I willing to put up with these hiccups that we had this last couple of weeks and still be totally committed to webinars? Uh, I'm going to talk you through what makes webinars so effective. And then we'll we'll wrap things up and we'll fill you in on the, the course at, at the end. Uh, but, oh man, when webinars go wrong, uh, they can just be, there can be so many different places. That's one of the things about webinars is they're very critical from the fact of that that they're they're live and they're relying on a lot of things working properly. Uh, from your marketing and getting people uh, attending through to the technical delivery, through your content. So I break the, down the disasters into four areas, technical disasters, marketing, content, and delivery disasters. All of them have an equal opportunity to completely derail your webinar. Now, I just, just for those of you that might not have uh, know our backstory very much, I've got, I've been there for a long time. I've got over 15 years in traditional broadcast and TV and radio. We had a syndicated television show in Canada. I did live radio back in the, uh, back in the 1990s. We did a simulcast. We, every Sunday morning, we did two hours of live radio and TV simulcast at the same time, uh, where we were combining all the technologies and bringing them all together which is a great trainer and a great primer for doing webinars. I got to tell you, we had a little uh, robotic TV studio and we did several years or three years of broadcast, which was uh, kind of groundbreaking at the time. Uh, but since uh, when I stopped doing the TV show in about 2011, uh, we started to do webinars. I was just drawn to webinars. It was a natural progression for me, having a broadcast experience, having the radio, being a technology guy, because my TV show is all about, about technology and webinars are a fascinating piece of technology. So I just naturally gravitated towards them, also believing that I probably had a lot to offer that community that it might not be there. Uh, now, I don't have statistics before because I, I, I didn't keep track. But looking in my webinar management software, just since April of 2015, when we've got the last upgrade that we had to Webinar Jam, we've done over 95 webinars. Well, we're over 100 now with the, with the last couple of weeks, with over 56,000 registrants. And we've used webinars uh, to sell all of our courses. We have 4,000 students in our, in our courses. So we have been using webinars really effectively as a business, as a growth tool, as a, uh, it's really, the Dottotech has really grown on the back of two technologies, YouTube and webinars. And webinars are so much more engaging. They're just, uh, I'm, I'm obviously quite passionate about them. So I'm wondering how your week's gone. Let me tell you about my week <laughs> for a few minutes. We've had a few audio issues. We've had a few video issues. We've had some migration issues and I'm sad to say I've had a few personal issues. Now I won't share all of the details, but let's start with the beginning. Let's, which is a very good place to start, I guess. Two weeks ago, we started to promote our new course, this Winning It webinar course. And as is a normal setup for us, it's a, with any product launch, any of you who that are involved in online marketing know that we kind of go through a procedure. And a big part of that is a launch webinar where we uh, deliver some value de around the content that's going to be in the course. And then we present the course at the end with an offer. 
and it's it's pretty standard. It's you know it's nothing nothing earth shattering. But the tool that we've been using is Webinar Jam. Now Webinar Jam is a fairly low cost webinar tool, but we use it not because of how inexpensive it is, but because of how wonderful its integration is with the rest of your backend systems. So I'm talking about how well it integrates with Infusionsoft. You see, webinars can do a lot of different things for you. Some webinars can be awesome for building your list. Others you can use for training. Others you can use for sales. But when you're in marketing, in, in online marketing and sales, as we are, or as it certainly was our, um, what we were focusing on, on this particular uh, webinar, integration with Infusionsoft, knowing who appeared at the webinar, being able to send follow-up sequences for emails, offering them, trying to get them enrolled, you know, for people that was appropriate, getting them buying the course and enrolled in the course properly. That integration is magic. And Webinar Jam has it over every other platform, as far as I'm concerned. As far as the technical delivery, I don't think any webinar platform is perfect. Uh, they've all got issues. They're all strong in some areas and weak in others. The one we're using right now, Zoom, is a wonderful platform, but it's not great for delivering video. Webinar Jam is great for delivering video, the hybrid style of webinar that we like. So, you know, I, I don't want to create a value statement as to why we chose one tool over another because they all have something to offer. But the one that we were using this week happened to be Webinar Jam, as is our normal. Well, Webinar Jam has recently got, undergone a fairly large technology overhaul, which was going swimmingly up to this point. Uh, because Webinar Jam used to be built on the back of Google Hangouts on Air, which Google has removed from the, the, the marketplace. Some would say good riddance to, to, to bad webinar technology because there was a massive uh, latency issue where, you know, when you, we would speak in 12 seconds later, you would hear us. So there was a lot of disconnect, whereas this Zoom that we're using right now is almost zero latency, which is absolutely brilliant for creating dialogue and conversation. Uh, but Webinar Jam had its issues through because of uh, Google Hangouts on Air. Plus, Google metered how much bandwidth was available. So sometimes we were awesome with great quality and sometimes we had <laughs> quality. Well, they created their own tool for delivering the webinar called their Jam Room. And it had been working fine for us, just great, until our very first sales webinar. Seriously, the first time that we ran into an issue was as we were sitting there saying, we know how to deliver webinars and we'll teach you how to deliver webinars. And the only issue was nobody could hear me. I sounded like I was in the bottom of the ocean speaking through a tin cup. It was just brutal quality audio. And ironically, Jen and April, who were also on the call with us, they sounded fine. So he, it was me. And I've got hero bandwidth. I've got like 10 megabits per second up uh, from my, you know, a, a dedicated wired connection here. I've got, multi, we've just, I've got a kick-ass computer system. We've got the technology to deliver webinars really well. but. It was a disaster. And so we thought maybe it's a one-off because we did our regular webinar Wednesday feature the very next day and we had a record number of people in that webinar. We had over 500 people live in that webinar as we were showing Evernote and it was awesome. Of course, we weren't selling anything, but that webinar came off absolutely without a hitch. So of course we were confident again. <laughs> the very next day we did our next sales webinar again and it was the same, only worse. And so we had queued up from our list, over a thousand people to participate in these webinars. And they all thought, well, I think most people recognize that it probably wasn't our fault, but it still didn't reflect very well on us, did it? So we had all of these audio issues a, a second time. And that caused me to reach out to the folks at Webinar Jam and say, what the heck's going on? They say, yes, we can see that you're having issues. Uh, we can fix it for you. We're still working on it overall for the platform. And, you know, I'm not blaming them for this. By the way, when we credit, when we say that we made a switch from that platform, it, it's not that we believe that platform's bad. We will go back and use that platform again. All of these platforms face challenges as they're rolling out new technology and rolling out new tools because they're on a race, a feature race with all of the other webinar platforms. So we actually kind of push them ahead probably faster than if they weren't in, the, in this seriously competitive environment than they would normally be. So this isn't a value statement on one tool versus the other tool. This is just right now for this time, we didn't have confidence that we were going to be able to deliver our product in Webinar Jam. So we had to make a switch. So, uh, and that's one of the hallmarks that I'm going to talk about of being a, of delivering professional webinars is you have to be flexible. If, if a tool's not going to work, you have to choose the tool that will work. And so I made a decision on, on the, uh, we, we, as we had a webinar coming up just a few days later, 
to new people who were coming in, who were, were coming in that weren't part of the dot of tech community. So we have a little less leash with these people. We had to deliver a webinar. It, you know, they wouldn't necessarily understand technical issues because they wouldn't have taken webinars for, with us in the past that were delivered flawlessly. So we don't have any credibility with them. They were new, uh, a great opportunity for us. I didn't want to blow it. So we <clears throat> set up and, but we'd already started registering people for those. That's the other problem is we'd already started registering people for that webinar. We already had the landing pages built and it was our partners recommending it to other people. Uh, it was, was what that community was going to be a small group, but they were all fresh and all coming in from friends of ours. So I didn't want to screw up. I never want to screw up, but I especially didn't want to screw up then. So we moved over to zoom, but now what we had to do is we had to take everybody from webinar jam and let them know that there was a new registration game in town that they had to, that they were going to have to log in in a different place. So we had a migration issue where we had to migrate people over. Uh, it didn't start out being a problem, but it became a problem <laughs> because we had a, we had a glitch in our email software, which was again, completely something that you couldn't plan on. Uh, but so we migrated everybody over to zoom. Now zoom I've used quite a bit as a meeting tool. I haven't used it an awful lot for actually delivering webinars. So we decided that we were going to deliver the webinar the exact same way, feeding the video through, and we were going to see how it we were going to see how it works because I had a pre-recorded piece. Then we had a unexpected event. We had a migration issue where our email software, instead of just enrolling, and we set up an automatic system to enroll the existing people into the new webinar, instead of just enrolling the people who had enrolled in the webinar already, it decided to enroll everybody. When I mean everybody, I mean everybody, our entire list, 135,000 people. And just as I was heading out on Friday evening, I looked at my, at my management console in, 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 our, in our CRM, and I saw there was 14,000 people enrolled in the webinar on Tuesday. I went, oh, no, we have a problem. So April got on the problem right away. We solved the problem. We figured out what was going on. But now we had to clean up the mess. We had to send out an email, a mea culpa email to everybody saying, we made a mistake. We had a problem in our, in our email software. You are not enrolling. People think, what the heck are you doing, Dotto? Are you, are you spamming me? Are you enrolling me in a webinar I never signed up for? So we spent the entire weekend apologizing, falling on our sword, cleaning all of that up instead of being in sales cycle with sending out emails, encouraging people to purchase the product, which is what we normally would have been. So we lost a whole bunch of time and traction with that. But having said that, Unexpected consequences having nothing to do with the webinar, but still having everything to do with our webinar. Fast forward, we delivered the webinar uh, and it went fine, but I wasn't happy with how uh, Zoom recorded the webinar for the, for the replay because we always like to record our webinars and make them available in replay. And to be honest, I think one of the weaknesses of Zoom is how it records the webinar. So I said, I've got a cunning plan and for the next webinar, I'm going to change that up. So we changed up how we we're going to record it. And instead of, the, instead of relying on their recording, I, because I have a very powerful system here, said I'm going to record the entire webinar on my desktop as I deliver it. And everything was fine except the video that we would feed because Webinar Jam uh, uses video and uh, GoToWebinar, they all allow you to upload video to, say, YouTube or Vimeo and then stream it into your webinar from a service online. Zoom doesn't allow you to do that. Zoom insists that you host the video locally on your computer street and then stream it. So it has to do an uplink with the video. Now it worked fine the first time, but the second time that I did it, because what I was going to do is now record locally, it was too much processing power for my computer. Even though I've got a Mac pro with eight processors, basically eight computers in one box, 32 gig of Ram, super powerful hard drive. It was still too much for it. And the video feed to our community that day, was crap. I think that's a technical term, crap. And it was, it was in, in, but we didn't know that it was because of processing power. So I had to re-engage with the folks at Zoom, figure out what went on. And so now we've gone to plan B. So I actually have my auditing notebook now. So the video that you'll see if you watch the replay, I'm actually recording it on ScreenFlow on a notebook. And then I will take that and I will edit that into this video because it will then now incorporate both the slides, my video feed, and the chat, which I love to have in the replay because chat adds so much. So <laughs> you'd think that would be the end of it, would you not? And it should have been the end of it, but it wasn't. Because on our very last webinar of the entire series, which was Thursday, 
of this week. It was a special webinar that uh, one of our best corporate friends, Thinkific, they invited their entire community and we had some 700 people from the Thinkific community doing a webinar. We created a custom webinar for them, custom content for them around using webinars in the course management and course creation and course delivery and course sales side. And so it was going to be awesome sauce. And But Thinkific asked for us to start our webinar at 11 a.m. Normally, we start them at 10 a.m. And, you know, I've had a rough couple of weeks. You know, I've told you my story now. You've, you're like my psychiatrist. You're saying, Steve, it's going to be fine. Yeah, it should be fine. But I'm getting ready to go, and it's closing in on 10 a.m., and I'm going, oh, and I, and I had an epiphany. Oh, wait a minute. The webinar doesn't start till 11. I am okay because I'm a creature of habit. I was in my routine. So I said, that's great. I don't have to start till 11. At that moment, our neighbor's dog broke through the fence. My dog, Farley, goes crazy. Our neighbor's dog is a humongous Bernese mountain dog that weighs like 150 pounds. And so I had to corral this beast and my dog, and I had to get him back to the neighbors, got him there, got the fence patched up, and now, by now I've forgotten, though, that the webinar starts at 11 and not 10 because I'm like, oh, dealing with things. At that moment, a family member showed up with a family issue that they wanted to talk to me about, but they never called first. They never texted me. They never told me they were coming by. No, no, no. They just show up and said, I need 15 minutes of your time to talk about something that's serious going on in the family. It's not totally serious, but it's something that we have to deal with. Okay. I sit down. I deal with the family issue. Get them on their way. Now I'm totally in personal mode, not in business. I was like, oh, geez, I got to get focused again. I come in here and it's just rolling up to 10 a.m. So what do I do? Start the webinar. And I'm going, where's April? Where's Jen? Why do we only have 30 people in the webinar? Holy cow, this list did not, we, I thought we had, we had 700 people register. Doesn't matter, Steve. <laughs> Delivered the whole webinar. Just about 11 a.m., all of a sudden, April appears in the room. I go, well, thanks for showing up, April. And she goes, uh, am I late? I said, I think so. I think we're just wrapping things up. She goes, it doesn't start till 11. And it was like light bulb went off in my brain. We had audio issues. We had video issues. We had email issues. And we had personal issues all in the delivery of a webinar in a week. Now, some of those we can do something about. Some we can't. But at the end of the day, <laughs> think that we've had an advanced course in webinar disasters in a very compressed period of time. And I think I've learned lessons from each and every step on the way. I hope that we never repeat any one again. Uh, but it certainly sets things up to allow us to kind of go through with you right now where webinars can go wrong. So that's the backstory. Let me talk to you about breaking that down into practical mode and things that you can worry about because you're hopefully not going to have a Bernese mountain dog break in moments before your webinar starts. If you do, you're on your own because I don't really have great advice for that. So the, from a technical disaster point, and some of these we're going to be able to refer back to our weeks, choosing the wrong tool. This is a big deal. Uh, making sure that you have the right webinar platform chosen. And this is unfortunately one of the decisions that you have to make sometimes when you don't know a lot about webinar, your own delivery of webinars. But each webinar platform, we're in Zoom right now, Webinar Jam, GoToWebinar, Webinar Ninja, uh, Crowdcast. Every webinar platform has strengths and weaknesses. And primarily, what you have to really consider is what they were built for, kind of the genesis of the application. Zoom, that we're in right now, excels in conversation, excels in kind of conference type applications where you have multiple people on, where it's very conversational. The, the lack of lag time means that it's great. There's, there's no delay between what's happening here and what you're seeing. They've got great conversation, really relatively good conversation tools as far as managing things like whiteboards and sharing screens as I'm doing with, with, uh, with the slideshow. They're okay as far as chat. They suck as far as video. I'm going to say that. And they're not great as far as recording, as far as I'm concerned. Now, they might disagree, but I don't really don't think that they really are, are super strong in that space. So if you're doing lots of webinars that require lots of interaction and lots of, uh, lots of chat happening with your community, it might or might not be a great tool. If you do hybrid webinars as your standard, where you pre-record a piece of your webinar, deliver live, and then rely on video, I wouldn't recommend Zoom as a start at all. Choosing the right tool is essential. Uh, making sure that it integrates with your CRM, that it's going to be quick for you to set up, that it has the flexibility. Choosing the right tool causes many a webinar disaster. Going hat in hand with that is lack of respect for the tech. 
not knowing your tools intimately. Now, we delivered, and I'm kind of guilty of this myself, if you think about it, because when we delivered our first Zoom webinar, just because of the compressed time frame, uh, I was using Zoom and I hadn't tested it out in webinars. I hadn't used it in a webinar in anger in six months. So, I, so I, there were some things about the technology that I was not 100% clear on. For example, I understood how we would deliver video, but I didn't understand what the ramifications of were on my resources of my computer when I added an extra layer of doing screen capture. So I didn't dive in deeply enough to know all of the aspects of the technology. I know now, and now we've created a system that works for us because you can make any system work if you understand the technology. You have to know that technology intimately. And the last issue is no plan B, not having a, uh, a way out of a problem with a webinar. You know, the week before, we, and actually I didn't even mention the, the one the disaster because it didn't end up being a disaster. We had a video issue even back when we were using Webinar Jam in that I had actually uploaded a video that was corrupt. We didn't know it until we started to play it and it didn't play within the webinar. At that particular case, what happened, I just switched over to the slideshow, which I had preloaded and I had prepared. Now, that is me always being prepared for uh, the most likely scenarios of failure within a webinar. And I know that in a webinar, if you're delivering a hybrid webinar where you're delivering the video, that the video might not feed for some reason. If that happens, you have to be prepared to for plan B, which in our case was having the exact same content available as a slideshow. So I delivered it just as you're seeing I would now. Now, because I knew my content, I knew my technology, I had a plan B in place, we were able to seamlessly jump over at that moment and deliver that content. And many people on the webinar never even knew we had an issue. Uh, and the people that did know that we had an issue, we actually ended up probably coming out ahead of the game because they saw how elegantly we dealt with it and we didn't let it bother us. So plan B always, and I spend a lot of time, whenever I'm preparing a webinar and looking at a webinar, part of my brain is always thinking what could go wrong. I think this comes from a back, I have a live ba background of live theater. I've done live theater for years and years. And when I'm rehearsing a show, uh, I've almost got a database in my brain of every time we have a, a mistake in rehearsal, I say, oh, what happens if that happens in the performance? What am I going to do when that happens in the performance? So when we do have issues live on stage, I'm prepared m most of the time. Uh, and able to then react as opposed to panic, start thinking, recognize, oh, this is the path we went down before. What was I going to do? And then be able to switch over to it. I have the same philosophy as I prepare webinars. And so often it comes down to technology, seeing where a piece of technology might break and then knowing what can we do to overcome that. That is considered what I would consider the skills that a professional webinar presenter should have in their toolkit. Now let's talk about marketing disasters. And marketing disasters won't be as evident to you as a participant in a webinar as much as they're, a, they're a, a real tragedy for the people who put the webinar on because they do all this work to create a great webinar, create great content, to get bums in the seats, or you know they basically focus their business objectives on a webinar, and then they don't turn people out. And or they don't have people show up. So, I consider marketing disasters to be very much self-inflicted wounds that kind of uh, that lurk beneath the surface. You don't necessarily see them. But the worst is, of course, if there's crickets. If you show up for your webinar and, and nobody shows up. And, uh, and so not having an effective marketing plan. And unfortunately for this, for that, you know, there's nothing that we can tell you in the short term and the technical delivery of a webinar that's going to get people to show up. This is you having a healthy content, uh, content creator mentality, building your list. Uh, understanding your community, delivering quality so that they trust you so that they'll show up. But the webinars are at the far end of a process of building reputation, building your brand, building your email list so that you can deliver value to your community. So no effective marketing plan is a big issue. Where we can help you technically on this is your promotional timing. I think a lot of people, especially when they're doing their first webinars, think that as soon as they've decided to do it, they're going to create their landing page, they're going to create the registration system, and they're going to get it out there. And they might get that webinar out there weeks in advance. And while they think that if it's around for a long time and available, they're going to have more registration because there's more opportunity for people to stumble across it organically, I think, in fact, if you start promoting a webinar too early, it ends up being a net negative for several reasons. The first is there's no urgency for people to sign up if it's three weeks away because they don't know what they're going to be doing three weeks away. Secondly, if they do sign up, 
it becomes stale on their calendar. Now, what that means is that they might forget about it when it comes up, even though it's on their calendar. But even more kind of insidious is if you've got an appointment on your calendar for three weeks, you've got other things that have come up in the meantime that that's gotten in the way of. So you might decide that this webinar is more important, but you're starting to resent the fact it's there. It goes from being an opportunity to an obligation. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? It goes from opportunity to obligation. And at that point there, it's not the right relationship. It's not making us feel good about each other, is it? So we recommend three days to a week in advance to start promoting your webinar. Now, this takes trust. This takes trust in you and your ability to get people to register because you're a few days out and there's nobody registered yet. You're going, oh, damn, I'm nervous. I want some names on that list. Uh, but if you, once you've done it a few times and you recognize the fact that you have credibility with your community, they will open your emails and your invites, they will come and they will sign up last minute. Then you could, then I think that you can increase your turnout rate and really reduce the amount of stress that you have on yourself about getting people out. Promotional timing is a really mature aspect of delivering effective webinars. You go through all this effort to get people in the room. And then you don't have a follow-up plan. You don't have some way to continue to engage. It's like going on a date. You work all this time on a date, and if you don't text or call the person afterwards, uh, you know the, the relationship is going to wither and die. You have to have a follow-up plan and a way to continue to engage your audience. If it's a sales webinar, having a series of a series of reasons for them to purchase or incentive and in offers to go down the pipe. If it's a regular webinar, the, the, the sort that we do with it, which is educational. We follow up with the replay link, making sure people know about it. And so that people that missed it get to see it. And even that people that haven't missed it, there's a kind of a self-serving aspect to the follow-up email is to remind you if you did participate in it, how good it was, if it was good. Say, oh yeah, Donald, those guys came through again. Looking forward to the one next week, right? So you're, 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 it's very much a relationship building, having a follow-up plan. The last marketing disaster is one of the worst, and it's the bait and switch. And I think it undermines the value for all of us of webinars. And that's where people say, come, if I was to say, you know, come learn about the basis of doing great webinars. You show up at, the, at my webinar on webinars. And then I say, I'm going to teach you how to make great webinars if you sign up for my course. I'm not going to teach you anything useful right now, but instead I'm going to teach it to you if you sign up for my course. And that's, a, that's being disingenuous. And that's, I think that hurts us all. And we've all seen that happen. Here, I'm going to give you 10 great tips. I'm going to give you the first tip, but you have to sign up for something more to get the rest of the tips. I think once you have committed to me by giving me your email address, signing up, coming to the webinar, that it's it's incumbent upon me now to deliver exactly what I promised for that webinar. That's how we build relationships long term. And the and the webinar providers that don't do that, I think, do us all a disservice. So and and you you've all participated in them. Right, we've all, we've all had that, and we all have go away with the same with the same issue from those. Then there are content disasters, and I think content disasters really represent lost opportunity in many many cases. Now, I talk a lot about formula versus format. Those of you that have taken my screencasting course or even watched my screencasting webinars where I talk about how we make our videos for YouTube, know that I'm a big fan of format not necessarily formula. And many webinars that you look at, many webinar uh, systems that people will teach you uh, are based on formula. Now, let me explain the difference between formula and format, at least from my perspective. Formula is an infomercial. Format is a sitcom. Formula follows, uh, the formula of an infomercial follows this path where they outline the problem, they outline the solution, they outline the deal, they create urgency with the bargain and the offer. They follow the same formula. Format for a sitcom also follows a structure, but it is far broader in how it approaches the structure. And it's not just sitcoms. Dramas have it, movies have it, books have it. They follow a format where for television, we typically have a cold opening which may or may not, depending if it's a comedy or drama, may or not reflect what's happening within the show itself. Uh, so the cold opening is the, the characters establish a situation. Then they go to, they do their, their opening credits, and then they come back and they establish the premise. What's the, what's the, what's, what's the conflict going to be today? Then they have the, the, the comedy aspect of it or the maturation of it or the narrative of what happens with that. And then there's the resolution. 
right? Typically speaking, that's the, and you'll follow a narrative arc through it. Now that's a simple, simple sitcom. Uh, you obviously get much more complex, but if you watch NCIS or any of those, any of those series, you can see the format laid out for you. It's different than formula, but it's got some of the same hallmarks of formula. As a content creator, as a person creating a webinar, you can go down either path and both work. Believe me, formula webinars will work for what they're intended for. They will sell. They're very effective. There's no doubt in my mind that they're a good way to go if you have a very narrow set of objectives and you want to like sell a product, a formula is going to work. I think it's far healthier for us, though, to learn about a format that works for us and works for our community. It gives us a basis for creating ongoing content far more effectively, and that's what I concentrate on. So while both work, I think one is a more professional, more mature, more flexible way of creating content, creating a format as opposed to a formula. The next issue is just low-quality content. A lot of people are afraid to give away their best stuff, especially if they're in sales where they're creating webinars that are going to be designed to sell a product, not giving away true, valuable, really actionable items, uh, I think is, 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 a, is a lost opportunity to, 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 to create a much firmer relationship with your community. I think you have to trust yourself and your ability to come up with more good content as you go along and not believe that your one good idea is the only good idea you'll ever come up with in your life. And you also have to trust your community to recognize that when you give something of value away to them, that is a down payment on future business with them. So delivering low quality content, I think is immature and, well, you know, that sounds harsh, but it's an immature approach, meaning that you don't have the levels of trust in both yourself, your content, your ability to create more content and the nature of your community that you can engender by being, by, by forming a real relationship as opposed to just, you know, trying to sell something. Lack of preparation for webinars. You know, uh, I can't, you know, I, I have a, I have a routine that I go through before the webinar. The reason I had that issue around my 10 AM webinar is my routine got broken up and that's why I lost track. Uh, but the preparation going through making sure that I'm in the right headspace for an energy for presentation, how early I open the webinar, how early I sit down, exactly what I do physically around me. All of those things are part of my preparation. Now, you don't necessarily have to have be ritualistic the way that some people are in setting up your webinar, but knowing your content inside and out, being prepared for the questions, being prepared for the different technical eventualities, uh, being prepared, uh, being ill prepared, and we've all taken webinars where the result, where the people are not prepared, uh, is a disaster. And the, the result of disasters at the content level is profound. It is the lack, loss of trust. We work so hard in the online world to build a community that knows us and trusts us that when we betray that trust by uh, being disingenuous, not giving away the best stuff, baiting and switching, doing any of those things, we lose trust. And I don't think in this world we get a second chance at a relationship in the online space. There's just too many other options, too many other good places to go. So if you have an opportunity to create trust, then you it's it's incumbent upon you to do that. And it's if you don't, I think it's gonna it's gonna dramatically impact your success long term. Every person that doesn't trust you that you lose, that's somebody you can't get back. And we know how hard we work to build our community. Uh, so content disasters be massive disasters. And finally, there's the team disaster aspect. Uh, or the delivery disaster aspect, which is, I think, where people don't respect how many moving parts there are in a webinar. They People think, I think, because webinars are, you're sitting down, you don't necessarily feel the room and see how many people are in the room. We have 158 people in the room right now. I, but it's the same, you know, as far as the physical space around me, it's the same as when I sat down this morning and was talking to Jen just before we started the webinar. There's no physical difference here. When I do a talk on stage, I walk out into the auditorium. I feel the physical energy of 158 people. That's a whole different charge. You need to recreate that charge as much as you can when you deliver. You have to recognize and respect how many people you have in the room and that there's that much life force being spent with you at that moment. Consequently, if you try and do everything yourself, I think that you're, I think that you're undercutting the value you can deliver to your community. Coming from a television and radio background, I never had to worry about hitting the on-air button or answering the calls or queuing up the next commercial as I was delivering content on television. 
I had a little IFB in my ear. I had a floor director. I had a producer talking to me. I had everybody taking care of things so that I could focus on content delivery to the market that we were delivering to. I was in performance mode, in presentation mode. Everybody else was in technical mode. You want to create that same environment in a webinar. I think doing webinars solo is a bad idea because you can't technically deal with any issues, even small issues, and deliver content at the same time. You cannot multitask like that. So, for example, 156 of you in the room at this moment. Let's say five of you are having audio issues. If I was managing the technical aspect of the webinar, I'd be following the chat right now as I'm trying to deliver the content. I would see those issues and I'd be trying to solve things for those five people right now, which means that, which means, which means that 151 of you would not be getting value because you'd be waiting for me to solve the audio issue. Instead, if you've got a technical producer that deals with those issues, the content producer can still be plunging ahead, giving 151 people great value because they're concentrating on the content, oblivious of the small issues. Now, this isn't when a webinar goes completely south. When we had the audio issues, the team had to let me know 100%, right? So uh, when you have catastrophic failure. But when there are minor issues, which there often are because of the way that the internet is just this, this matrix of different feeds, this allows you, by having a team, it allows you to, to, uh, to, to service uh, your community much more effectively by staying on point and on topic. And it goes beyond that aspect. Some of the styles of webinars that we create are hybrid webinars, which I've mentioned, where we include video. Now, what happens then is we actually have ILA going to chat while that's happening. And again, the team being in chat, me in chat, means that we can answer more questions in the delivery for, the, for, the, for our participants that don't mind multitasking in chat and following the webinar at the same time. But having team members in chat means that they can answer a lot of the questions, they can queue it up, so the entire process moves more smoothly. One of the reasons I'm a big, big fan of Webinar Jam is they're the only webinar tool that has a producer's console. They actually have a management screen that's entirely different than the webinar screen, where you see all the different digital assets of the webinar all listed out, from the chat to the questions to all of the assets that they're going to insert, like, uh, like offers, polls, videos, Anything like that happens, and you can see a current count of what's happening. You can even tie it into a sales system, and you can see sales happening in, the, in real time. It's just like a radio or television producer's management console or switch, switcher where you, can, where you can basically manage all of your assets. I love that aspect. And, it, it, and treating a webinar as you would a broadcast means that it's that much more professional. You will notice the professionalism as a viewer. So it's a team game. Uh, again, I put down lack of preparation because preparation is everything. Testing means that you know all aspects of the tool yourself. And if you don't, uh, then, then, you know, you basically are a, not taking advantage of tools that are available to you, but also stumbling around means that you're basically diminishing the value to your community. And the final one here is lack of flexibility. And flexibility can be so many things as far as webinars. It can be changing your content moments before because something has changed changing your entire webinar delivery platform a week before, as we had to do in our particular case, but making sure that you are always focused on what's going to deliver the best quality value to your community. And that's the hallmark that carries you forward, not some relationship with a webinar company or platform or anything along that line, making sure that you're concentrating on maximum value to your community at any point that is essential as far as deliveries goes. Now, you might wonder, uh, you know, after all the disasters that I've talked about and after the last couple of weeks we have, why is Steve still so excited about webinars and why does he still unabashedly promote them? Because webinars are so freaking effective for so many different tasks. Um, and when I think about webinars, if you had to say what's the single most valuable aspect of webinars, Conversion, the ability for a convert to convert you onto our mail list at the beginning, uh, to convert you into a community member or possibly sell something to you downstream. Conversion is the biggest strength. Webinars are brilliant at building authority and relationships. They create real engagement because we have a conversation with our community. Uh, I think we all recognize the fact how valuable they are for training and informing. And every time we create a webinar, we've got a new package of content that we can repurpose which makes webinars, in my mind, uh, was that one, two, three, four, five, a five-a-pull thread. It's not a triple thread, it's five-a-pull. So <laughs> at the end of the day as well, you know, when, when, when push comes to shove, webinars make us money. Dotto Tech would not be a financial success without webinars. And I think a lot of you uh, will recognize a profound financial benefit 
when you engage in webinars. That's kind of, you know, at the end of the day, that, that matters. So I do want to address, how am I doing for time? Oh, we're doing good. Uh, a little, gonna be a little bit long today, but it's the weekend. Um, one of the things that we love, or sorry, one of the things that we seem to be currently enamored with is live. Facebook Live, YouTube Live, Instagram Live. And I think a lot of people think that's taken a little bit of blush off the rose for webinars, that webinars aren't quite as sexy because there's these new live things. And I believe that live is awesome. I think anybody that's starting out in the space right now, if you're just beginning to build your community, build your list, moving towards webinars, moving towards some sort of a, an online product delivery, uh, you are blessed right now because the explosion of live opens doors for you like nothing has before for us, period. It's a terrific terrific building opportunity, but live has limitations. First of all, this is live right now. Webinars are live. So it's not like we're not part of that equation, but there's a profound difference between a Facebook live or a YouTube live session in this webinar session we're in right now. And that difference is intent. You came to this webinar intent to consume the content that we were delivering. You knew what we were gonna be de delivering. You said, that's something I'm interested in. You signed up for it. You went through a process to sign up for it. You put it in the schedule. You came, you logged in, you came with intent. If you're perusing Facebook and something comes up in Facebook Live, that's a friend of yours or something that's, you know, that you're curious about, you'll start to watch that feed. But you are probably in Facebook as a diversion. You're probably <laughs> avoiding responsibility. You're not there to learn, that's for sure. You're there to see what's going on. You're there to be curious. You're there to kill some time. You're there to be entertained. You're not there to learn about the skills of doing a webinar. It's interruptional. Facebook Live is interruptional. It's a great opportunity to say, hey, I'm Steve and I do stuff on webinars. And if you're interested, maybe at some point you want to sign up or to establish a little bit of authority, but you will watch a Facebook Live session for between 30 seconds and five minutes tops. Maybe a little bit more if it's something super compelling, but not long. And if you ever deliver one, you'll see the you'll see it. Now, as it's left on Facebook and replays, you'll get some more views, but they aren't intentional views. They aren't scheduled. They aren't, they don't have to carry the same weight of import. Webinars still deliver because you've come with the intention of learning, with the intention of participating. And the fact that we have a conversion attached to the webinars where you have to sign up with your email address is it creates a quid pro quo where I get permission to market to you, to talk to you in the future, and you get great compelling content from me. But your marketers know at the end of the day, your list still is what's going to determine how profitable your business is in the online space. And nothing gets people on lists more effectively than webinars. And when you're delivering the webinar, the commitment, the fact that people have registered means that they're there with intent. It's your fertile soil to the topic that we're talking about. In Facebook, it's far more happenstance as to whether or not you're going to get, whether or not you're going to get real traction out of it. Now, what type of webinar do you use? Uh, you know, we use personally, we use three of these for our community. We use it for list building all the time. We do a weekly webinar called Webinar Wednesdays where we do a new webinar every week. And that's just pr pr primarily to service our community and to introduce new people to the Dotto Tech brand. Uh, they're, they are training webinars, but they are the combination of list building and training. That's what they do. Marketing webinars help you build your brand, build your marketplace, and then sales webinars ultimately convert. And then they're the most exciting ones because they actually have dollars and cents attached to the end. Uh, and, and they are there when you do a sales webinar and it goes off well and people start buying your product, it's a pretty good feeling. We'll, we'll do a little bit of sales. This isn't a super heavy duty sales webinar today, but we'll do some sales at the end and I'm hoping I'll feel pretty good at the end. I know you all will. So when we talk about the, the, the strengths conversion ultimately is the biggest strength in my mind of webinars. It is what sets it apart from live. This concept of having permission to send you an email once we're all said and done, all of those sorts of things, that is, that's just golden. And there's a trust of, uh, attached to it, meaning that once you've given permission, you have to follow up in an erstwhile method and, and not take advantage and not become spammy or, you know, overly salesy or sleazy. Uh, but that permission to communicate that, that it, with the list building side of webinars, in, in my mind, regardless of what stage of business you're in, webinars fit because of the fact that they, they, they do such a phenomenal job of list building. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, they'll take you right from building your list, getting your first people on your email list through to ultimately selling them your product when you're in a mature business. Now, I, I think you might be interested in this. We, I've been working hard on part of the webinar course and trying to articulate to people 
realistic expectations of how much money they can make from webinars and how much webinars convert. And I know you've all probably seen different metrics and different measurements. So I'm just gonna share with you what I believe to be the true metrics are. At least from my perspective, these all bear out pretty much spot on with every time we've done a sales webinar ourselves. From my conversations with my friends and my colleagues in the industry, it's spot on with them. I will tell you right up front, these numbers are lower than I hear other webinar sales, you know, other webinar systems telling you that you will achieve. But as far as I'm concerned, they're realistic. Are you interested in them? I hope so. Good. So typically speaking, once you have your mail list in place and you've grown your mail list and it's to whatever size, and we're going to, for this example today, we'll use 2000 names on your mail list, which is not an unattainable number by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but typically speaking, you're going to see about 10%. If you've established yourself with your community, you have a relevant topic, you'll see 10% of your people comfortably sign up for the webinar. And that's not the number that are going to show up, but that's the number that will sign up. I base my conversion rate not on the people who show up in the webinar, but the people that sign up because I have very good replay viewing and we do, we do, we, we tend to find our webinars are very long tail sales when we do our sales. So typically speaking, immediately after the webinar, we have a very small amount of sales, but towards the end of whatever the sales cycle is, it, it ramps up to the point where there's a, there's a flurry of sales, usually as the price is about to change on whatever product you're selling. And that's going to be typical in the industry. But I look at a 5% conversion rate. A lot of people will tell you you're going to convert at 10%. That's not been my experience. It's not been my friend's experience. 5% is the real number. So let's do, let's put it into real terms. So if you have 2,000 people on your list, which is a fairly attainable number, you're going to have 200 people register for your webinar. You're probably going to have somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 90 show up live. That's not the one that I'm concerned about right now. I'm concerned about the registration. Out of that, you're going to sell 10 products. So pricing becomes essential. What's the value? And that's based on you selling a, a valuable product and you know everything else being equal. So assuming a price of $200 means that your revenue is going to be $2,000. So with, and then all of these numbers increase, not necessarily the percentages of show up rate or sales rate, but all of the numbers increase as you grow the size of your list, which makes webinars really appealing as you get larger and larger numbers. So I guess if any of you are thinking about diving into the webinar pool, I have to ask you, does a one hour webinar that you deliver that earns you $2,000 if you've done, now this isn't just you're going to do this tomorrow. This is after you've gone through a process of building your list to a certain point, creating the content, creating the product, create, it's a lot of work that goes into this. Does that turn your crank? Is that something that's going to work for you? Now it's the single webinar. Now, could you do that webinar monthly or quarterly? And every time you do it, you're going to do it more effectively and better. So the metrics should get better as you go, but this is realistic. This is my experience from selling. And these numbers dovetail almost exactly with the size of my list with my first successful sale. I did 10% show up rate, 5% sales. Now my first product was $100, so I didn't make quite as much money, but the numbers went. And then in the, every launch that we've had since has followed these metrics almost identically. So take it for what it's worth. As far as I'm concerned, these are the real goods. So as you make your decisions moving into it, I want you to go in with eyes wide open. Now, the other benefits of webinars beyond making money is the opportunity to build authority. Nothing beats webinars, especially when you add video and you've got all of the different touch points of face, expression, energy. Nothing establishes you more effectively than, than video and webinars for establishing authority and building relationships because the real you comes out. Now, one thing that I think a lot of people leave out and I've, I've taken a couple of webinars the last couple of days, other people have delivered and they've shut off chat, which I think is a terrible mistake. They want people to concentrate hundred percent on them. Uh, uh, I want chat happening. Why do I want chat happening? Social proof comes from chat. We lose social proof in a webinar because you're by yourself. So you're making all the decisions whether you might like what the person's saying, but if you don't know that other people like it as well, it's a little hollow in a room when you're giving a presentation, the energy of the room it has everything to do with how well that presenter is accepted. People leaning forward, smiling, reacting, laughing, applauding, nodding their heads, shaking their heads, folding their arms. All of that's going to determine whether or not you're accepted or you're not, your content is accepted or not. And a good, and a good uh, speaker works the room. I, we, we surf on the energy of the room. You don't have this here, but we do have chat. 
and chat allows people to see. I agree with that. I did that. Oh, I don't know about that. All of those comments, the energy that happens in chat, I think creates the social proof to validate the content that's being delivered, which is why I insist when I record my webinars that I find a way to get the chat in the recording so that people get the real feel for the energy as it was being delivered. Crucial. Webinars, authority builders, superb. Next is engagement. You know, and this goes two ways. I mean, a lot of people think engagement means that it's great for you to feel engaged with me. Uh, but I think that the ongoing feedback that we get from you, as far as engagement goes, you validating our content, but also telling us what you're interested in and leading us to other products and other webinars is equally as valuable. Uh, and so this, the fact that there's a dialogue and there's a respect for the community that happens uh, between ourselves and you means that we're on the fast track to that internet nirvana, which is no like and trust. The people on the online space say you can't sell people products if they don't know you, like you, and trust you. They can't become your community members or your or your customers. Uh, and I think that webinars represent a fast track to that. We have so many different touch points, so many different ways for you to evaluate us. The engagement means that it's a it, it, it engenders that relationship that much faster. I didn't think we'd even need to spend too much time on the teaching, training, and informing. We know that webinars do a great job of sharing information. What you might not think as much about is how much information density you can pile into a webinar. When you add voice, video, the ability to insert video, uh, the ability to add chat for being able to support and answer questions quickly and effectively, even before the Q&A section, webinars deliver tremendous information density. The amount that I can share in a one-hour webinar versus almost any other format, webinars win, hands down, as far as the amount of content that you can convey you know, in a, say a one hour period. It's also very agile as far as deployment. We can make a change to slides or to our content minutes before or on the fly within a webinar. Uh, so it's as far as being agile, it's it's tremendous as far as its flexibility in allowing us to be uh, to, to 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 make sure that we're relevant at all times. And finally, you take all of this content and you can repurpose the investment in time that you spent creating it, creating videos, creating no, new opt-ins, creating evergreen webinars where people sign up again and they watch a replay of the webinar and see it as, as, as though it were live, uh, but in a replay mode, uh, which then allows you to kind of have real passive income or passive list building when you're not actually spending the time. Repurposing your investment in time in webinars is something that I insist all of our students do an awful lot of it. And we always concentrate on it. Every webinar that we create, every piece of content I create, I think about how I can use it and where it will be leveraged in, into other spaces. Uh, we also use it as anchor content for our courses. What are we doing for time? I see, oh, it's 11 o'clock. I think we're running a little bit long today. It's, it's Saturday. And I had that whole narrative at the beginning. Uh, so anybody that has to leave right now, there will be a replay sent out. So if you do feel you have to go right now, uh, you won't miss the Q&A. You won't miss anything if you watch the replay. And the replay will be in YouTube, so you don't have to watch the whole webinar. You can jump ahead to the one-hour mark to catch it. So don't worry about that. So if you have to go now, I'll, I'll let you go, but we're going to continue plunging ahead. Uh, so um, we've often done webinars that are anchor content for our course material. As a matter of fact, we use webinars as the delivery mechanism for a lot of content in all of our courses. Uh, and so it, it works very well. Even courses that we charge for, we've uh, charged for the webinar first, and then we've converted that course, that that core content into a course. And it, they work, it, it works really well. It's totally flexible in that space. Um, and of course, just creating evergreen evergreen webinars themselves. Uh, we've all taken pre-recorded webinars, and uh, and they work. It works tremendously well. So pulling out of this, if I was to kind of give you one little tip for each area. When we talk about the strength of conversions, my tip for conversion, if you are starting out, is make sure you segment your list right from the beginning. Make sure you go know as much about your community as you can. In the Dotto Tech world, we've got people that are interested in productivity and Evernote and paperless office. And then we've got people interested in the online marketing and uh, webinar and screencasting space. Making sure that list is segmented as early as possible is, is something that you should pay attention to right from the beginning of your online business. I wish I'd paid closer attention to it earlier. We spend a lot of time trying to segment you and trying to make sure that you are all in the proper silos uh, now. So that's something that you can do right from the beginning. A philosophy of always delivering value. Every time you're online, it's an opportunity. And respecting the fact that people are spending, you know, you, we have 150 people or 140 people now. That's 140 hours 
of productivity that I've just taken out of the work workplace, Mo lawns not being mown and dishes not being done and letters not being written to pay attention to us. You have to respect that and constantly deliver value. If you honor your community, honor your content, deliver value and always be religiously focused on that, I think that you will ultimately have real success with your community. I know that I consider that to be a hallmark of why we have the success that we've had with our community. Uh, listening to what people say. I always have ideas on what my courses should look like and what content and what webinars we should be delivering. But invariably, when I listen to what you ask for, it resonates better and it's more successful. Listening to your what your community tells you, I'm firmly of the belief that the reason we had our early success on YouTube is YouTube chat, or YouTube comments, is I pay attention to every single comment in YouTube, listen to what you're telling me you wanted to see and create more videos in the space that you're asking me for. Your community will lead you to success if you bother to listen to them. Knowing your tools and content, just don't take anything for granted. Always be questioning about them. I sign up for the, I always visit the Facebook groups of all of the tools that I use. I look through the issues that people are having, the ideas, the opportunities. If you know your tool, you can leverage it far more effectively than people that kind of just use it at the, uh, you know, skim the surface with the tool. And finally, making sure that you leverage every piece of content that you create, that you, that you take the content and you share it. And here's, here's one aspect of this. If you've worked hard to create a good, compelling piece of content, you know that your community is going to be value, is going to value it. It's incumbent on you to then shine a light on it and share it so more people have access to it. The internet guards aren't going to say, oh, Steve, you created a great piece of content. Now we're going to share it to the world. No, that doesn't happen. You've got to decide how to get it out there, how to breathe new life into it, and how to share it. So that's a, a big part of it as well. So I'll take a few minutes now. I'll fill you in on the course. For those of you that I'm, I'm sure, I'm, I'm hoping that some of you are interested in it, uh, we've launched a brand new course called Winning at Webinars. And this course actually began about four years ago. Uh, I have an Evernote note in my notebook that started four years ago where I was determined to do a course on webinars, bringing my experience from the broadcast world and the technology world together to teach people how to do more effective webinars. Uh, so it's this course is how to create, promote, and execute and leverage webinars, how to, how to use them at the heart of your business. And it's a combination of both live and self-paced learning. So it's, there's six modules in it. Each one is going to be delivered live, but then it becomes the anchor content uh, for that module in the course. And there'll be supporting lessons and supporting content as well. So you don't have to attend live. They'll all be recorded. Now, one unique thing about this, and which is, I think, a great idea, is all of the live modules are going to be presented in different webinar tools. We're planning at this point in doing at least one each and probably two each in go to webinar, Zoom, and webinar jam. And depending on the mix of students that we have, we might add a different webinar tool. But it means that you're going to see the tools both from the perspective of participant and trainer, and you're going to see how they fit. Uh, and so you'll, it, it'll help you, especially if you're on the fence about what product to choose or you want to know about which, what are the strengths of all of the different webinar platforms. That's a big part of what we cover within the course itself. Um, the course is from the perspective of me, which is a broadcast professional. Uh, you know, if you talk philosophically, I'm going to teach you format, not formula. Uh, you're going to learn how to deliver a great show and you're going to learn how to make sure that your webinars are successful from your business perspective concentrating on list building, concentrating on getting people enrolled in your webinars, concentrating on delivering webinar content that has value, and then converting that. And with realistic expectations of what you can earn, if it's, if it's sales that is your goal, or how many people you can be registering, what the investment of time and energy is to build your list to a certain size. Reasonable metrics, realistic goals, and success. That's what this webinar course is all about, practical from that perspective. I'll quickly go through the modules. Getting started is getting started. Webinar tools, the choosing your platform, physical setup of your gear, and also the technology that you need to have in place as far as what you can be at, what you should be asking your internet service provider for, ensuring creating some sort of a backup system so that you can deliver webinars when things do go wrong, all of the technical aspects. Crafting your content is a beast of a module. There's two huge modules, the marketing and the crafting. So crafting your content is really where I'm going to be teaching formula versus format, how you develop a webinar format yourself that's going to work for you and what your, what your touch points within that webinar are going to be. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a module that I'm really looking forward to because when people have that aha moment, when they understand and they can see kind of in 3D what their webinar is going to look like, it becomes so much easier for you to create your content. And you have so much more confidence when you start, when you hit broadcast of exactly how to deliver that content in a fulfilling way. 
crafting your content module too. Running the webinar is a mini broadcast. It's going to broadcast school, learning who should be working on your webinar with you, how you should manage that webinar, how what your role should be, what your expectations from your team should be and versus yourself, and also how to then in, engage your community, how to get the outcomes from within the webinar that you want. Running your webinar is the third module. Marketing, the fourth one, it should probably be a course by itself, but we'll be dealing with all of the expectations around list building. I actually have a matrix, which is uh, where when we talk about marketing our webinar, we look at what our goals and outcomes of that webinar should want, we want to be. And let's say for argument's sake, it's a sales webinar. And if you have your list at 2,000 people, as was my example, then when you run that first webinar, we want to see $2,000 if you're charging $200 profit or whatever. We're going we're gonna to plug in the numbers before so we know exactly what you're going to get out of that webinar. When you don't get it out of your webinar, when, if, it, if it succeeds, great. But if it doesn't hit those numbers, it's not the end of the road. We have a matrix of where we look through each of these aspects of each of the different, touch, uh, each of the different uh, um, uh, points that you do as you create a webinar, all the way from your list building, all the way through to your follow-up. And we look for where that webinar came up short. And then you up your game the next time in each space until you achieve the results that you're looking for. I don't think webinars are a, it'd be nice if it could happen. I think webinars are a sure thing if you follow the process. If you go through, if you've got content that's valuable, if you, if you, if you follow the, the rules and the community building guidelines that we're talking about and you go with a giving heart and you have valuable content, I think success is when, not if. And it's when you work your way through the different roadblocks and challenges. We had to do it ourselves. The first webinars that I gave and the first sales webinars weren't very good. I didn't have my feet under me. I didn't really know. I didn't know what the important parts were. I didn't know what made a difference and I didn't necessarily understand that. Once I started to understand that and I, and then I could pay attention, those things, and I still have webinars go a little bit off the rails. This last couple of weeks is a prime example, but we know now what to look for, what to fix, what to shore up next time. So you'll be successful. It's a question of time and energy and effort, but I believe firmly that webinars will be 100% successful. That's why marketing your webinar actually is, almost is a course in itself. Then after the webinar. Now after the webinar it deals partly with marketing and your follow-up, but it also deals a lot with what, how do we take this asset and turn it into something that's more valuable than it was when we started. Creating a replay, using it on YouTube, breaking it up, turning it into a blog post, sharing it in different ways, turning it into an evergreen webinar. How do we manage, how do we leverage that content so that it performs for us ongoing. And the sixth module is about performance. This is kind of unique, I think, uh, it's something that I probably provide that's a little bit unique from other uh, webinar teachers, is 20 years of television and radio, uh, longer on stage. I understand performance. And even though I'm a pretty good performer, here's the thing. The thing I miss the most from doing television is having a director telling me what to do. Having a director monitoring my performance, energy, levels, cohesiveness presentation and coaching me on it and saying, Steve, let's do it again, but do it this way. I've had to become my own director, seeing how I perform, watching my webinars, watching my performances, and then determining what I did right and what I did wrong and how I can present it better. I'm going to coach you up on that space so that you can put your best foot forward. I think you're all better performers than you probably give yourself credit for. And we will get that out of you in module six. We will give you the confidence to perform well in webinars, even if you're a little bit camera shy. Uh, so it, uh, we also have a Facebook group, a private Facebook group, which is a big part of this webinar, working with others, going into other people, uh, other members of your cohorts webinars, sharing ideas and challenges, commonplace for all of the questions. The Facebook group is awesome. There's of course a 30 day money back guarantee as there is in all Dotto Tech courses. And the, one of the philosophies we have here in Dotto Tech is once you've signed up for one of our courses, uh, like this webinar course, when we refresh this course in three or six months, you get access to it again for free with any new content. We Once you buy one of our courses, once you have lifetime access to that course. We've got people now, we've done three versions of our screencasting course. We've had people from the very first version go through it all three times as the technology has evolved and they get something out of it each and every time, uh, which is great. And that's just the philosophy that we have here at Dotto Tech. Um, we begin May 8th, the week of May 8th. Uh, instructions are all going to be sent out for the, uh, the actual first course module is on May 9th, 
but May 8th, you'll be doing all the registration and all of the enrollment will be happening. Uh, the pricing, it's uh, $4.99 is the price of the course itself. Uh, we do have a launch special, which is kind of to celebrate uh, the, the, the beginning of the entire course. So if you use the code WWEB50, all uppercase, uh, it's good until the course launches. You can save $50 on the price of the course. Of course, as I said, there is a money back guarantee, and I'm sure Jen is dropping all of the relevant details in the chat as we go. And with that, oh, there are two other pricing options. I won't dive too deeply into them. If you are interested, you might want to reach out to us. We have a consulting package, which is at $9.99, $8.49, if with a discount. It includes uh, a series of one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with me. And so if you are interested in that, what will happen is as you're preparing your webinars, I'll deal with you with two sessions, one-on-one, -on -one, 45 minutes each, where we talk through any issues that you're having. Uh, we don't start the coaching until you've gone through the first three modules, at least of the course. But as you're preparing to do your first webinar, I'll help you with your content. I'll help you with your delivery. And then I will audit your webinar. I'll try and take it live if I can as far as time goes. If not, I'll watch the recording. And then I will debrief you and give you a critique of your, uh, of your live webinar uh, once it's done, which is incredibly valuable. I mean, all of, the, all of the years of television, radio, and webinars that I've got, I can watch a webinar. I can pick out things uh, quite effectively uh, that, that where you're doing things well and where you, where, you can, where you can do things better. And so that is part of the consulting package, which is available at $9.99. And then we have a mastermind group. It won't start until partway through, until uh, actually once we're through the entire uh, initial delivery of the course, because I fully expect the members of that group to come from people that are really getting in and really uh, finding value in the overall content and the overall concept of, uh, of webinars. But we once the course is done, we'll be enrolling people in a mastermind course. So that's something that you can be thinking about as well. And you can reach out to me for more information on that. And with that, I am done with the, uh, with this part and let us get back and see if there's any questions. Do we have any questions? We still have 122 people in the room. We have a lot of questions today. That's good. Yeah. Saturdays might be good for webinars. People are liking this. People are liking this. So. I have fun. Sorry you went a little bit long because that's because of my long narrative of my sad couple of weeks. <laughs> you know, but it was just going through this with you the last several weeks has been a little bit stressful, I would have to say. But hearing it all repackaged the way you, you express it was quite comical. It helped to lighten the mood. <laughs> Yeah, just like what's next? What's next? I know, and it's kind of how it's been, guys. It's well, when I when I started the webinar, and I did that webinar that day. I did an hour. I did the whole webinar twice on was it Thursday? Yes. It was just like what else? And it, it, and I didn't even have the pre-record. I had to do it live, and I spend a lot of energy in my webinars. Like when I deliver them live, I'm, you know, I'm a little sweaty by the time I'm all done, and my I, I spend I spend some life force on you, so. It was, <laughs> It was a long day on Thursday. I had a nap afterwards, I think. And Farley gets excited because I he thinks as soon as, you know, he he, he meters an hour because I always go for a W-A-L-K immediately after the webinar to clear my head. So he's going, ooh, it should be done. What are you doing it again for? <laughs> oh, poor Farley. Poor Farley. He had to wait for his W-A-L-K. All right. So let's jump into questions. All right. We have... Barbara has asked, um, she says she also just switched to Zoom. How are you integrating with Infusionsoft, also lead pages? I don't use lead pages. We use Optimize Press for our landing pages. Uh, so I haven't done the lead pages integration, but I imagine it should be pretty good. Zoom's integration with Optimize Press, uh, with uh, Infusionsoft, is less than optimal. You can create an API integration, but you have to do something in, in Infusionsoft called an HTTP post. HTT post. So you create a campaign when people register in Infusionsoft, it starts an action set or it starts a sequence and you create this HTT post and it's not hard to do, but it will then send the registration information through to Zoom. What we do then is we don't follow up in the email from Infusionsoft is we use the Zoom auto responder that has all of the built-in short code so people can register and it happens there. So you can test it once. Once it took us Took me maybe an hour to figure it all out. If you want detail on it, drop us a note and I'll record a little video walking through it for you. Um, but April and I have worked it all out. And now I can actually create a Zoom webinar, integrate it into Infusionsoft, 
and it takes about twice as long as it used to take me in 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 um in webinar jam because webinar jam had that beautiful integration where you just went through and you selected the uh, you selected the web for the tag and it was really easy. Now you do it. It's it's a few extra steps, but it's entirely doable and it's pretty bulletproof once it works. Just don't just don't enroll your entire list to one webinar or because uh -oh. <laughs> that, that's a problem. <laughs> oh, all right. Fred is wondering, how do I know when it's better to do a webinar instead of a face-to-face -face workshop? I've been trying to do some workshops for nonprofit executives, but they're not widely attended, if at all. I mean, getting people into your webinar is, is, is you know, it's, it's not a technical thing. It's a marketing thing at that point there. Um, I'd say numbers are going to dictate it. And when you, if you can focus on getting them in, I would record it mm -hmm. and then see if I can leverage that recording to maybe even snippets of that recording to entice people down the next, into the next, uh, into the next phase. Yeah. So, uh, that, that's the way that I would approach it. it it's, it's tough. It's tough. Um, but once you got them in once, if you deliver real value, you'll get them in again. That's the thing. Yeah. Angela has a webinar scheduled this week. And she's using Zoom where she's coming on live and then she's showing a one hour of pre-recorded material. Whoops. Um, then coming back on live. So she's asking, what issues did you have and any okay. suggestions yes, for I do. her? So if you've already output that video, I'm, you know, make sure that you, all of your resources on your computer turned off, that you've turned off Dropbox file sharing, that you don't have anything else running. Because what happens with Zoom is your computer is playing the video back and it's going to look fine, but it actually has to do all of the compression before it sends it up to the web to be broadcast to your community. So your computer is going to be working hard. So I'm hoping you have a fairly powerful computer. The second thing you can do is you can make sure that that video file is size appropriate for what Zoom. So Zoom doesn't send through 1080p, it sends through 720. So if you can reconfigure that video, if you could re-output that video to 720p, uh, making it, you know, basically not having any inf extra information. I think that's going to help you out a lot as well. When you choose to share, let me just check what the note is here. There's a notation. And when you choose to share, it's, uh, you've got the ability to optimize for full view clips. So when you go to share, don't just share your screen, but make sure that the, the quick time window or whatever your video playback window is, is, is in the same tab as you're in so that you can select it directly from the selection window. Um, I can't share this with you and show it to you. I don't think it, it'll share this with me. But make, but the optimize your for full video, uh, full screen video clip, that's going to uh, cause it to stream through with the best, um, what, what does it do there? It's got a higher frame rate and lower resolution. So basically you're making an accommodation always in Zoom. So you can have a lower frame rate, higher resolution, which is ideal for a slideshow, I think, about you want nice crisp, crisp fonts. When you're streaming your video, you will take a little less resolution to have a higher frame rate. Smoother is going to be more important. So set that as well. And good luck with that. That's a long ass video. I hope that <laughs> I'd love to hear how it works out. Yeah. All right. Um, Peggy, this was more of a technical question. I'm sorry, Peggy. I missed this during the actual vi or the not the video. I'm on video now. Um, the webinar. But she's saying she's coming up as me in the webinar chat and cannot change the two setting, which is at all panelists. This is the first time I'm watching since you changed to zoom. What do I need to do to correct these two settings? You know what? That's me. I user error. So all of the chat has just been to you and not to everybody. Everybody's going to see all the chat in the replay. You're not going to see it here. Now I just changed it. Every, now everybody, uh, Oh, where is it here? Uh, there it is. I then now I've set I've reset it. That's something that you should make. Can you make a note, Jen, to remind me to change the chat settings? And maybe you can set it. Can you if you look in the chat window right now, Jen, mm -hmm. and you go right next to where it says all panelists and attendees, the more uh, the more drop down. Can you yep. set it there? I did. Yeah, so you can you can take care of that in the future. Let's mention that to April as well. Yeah. Very good note. Okay. See this is we're learning. <laughs> We are learning. Um, Susie, if you're willing to share, what kind of conversions are you getting with your free webinar Wednesday model? Well, webinar Wednesday, the free model is actually, 
I, I, I don't have, I can tell you the overall success. Webinar Wednesday is focused on two things for us. It's focused on growing our mail list, which it has done very well. It's growing our list by 500 to 700 people per month, just Webinar Wednesday, which is great. And that's with no spend. The other thing Webinar Wednesday is Webinar Wednesday is attached to a community event, which is our Patreon account. We pitch Patreon a little bit in every Webinar Wednesday. We invite people to consider it. And we make the webinar each week a perk uh, after 48 hours just to our community. Really, I'm not doing anything with you yet. Go away. <laughs> Where's Shannon? Go see Shannon. There he goes. <laughs> there he goes. <laughs> now she's going, why are you sending to me? She doesn't, she doesn't talk like that. That was wrong. Speaking I'm telling. Of, send them to me. Um, sorry. <laughs> and then what we do is with Patreon is, uh, is then the webinar becomes archived to, for the benefit of our patrons. So we have seen, since we started doing this, and we talk about real conversions, we have seen our number of patrons and Patreon grow from just under 300 to 600 people that we have now online in supporting us in Patreon. And in dollars and cents, our Patreon support has gone from about $2,700 to north of $5,000 now a month mm -hmm. of support, which is which is what keeps the Dotto Tech engine going. Yes. So we're seeing some great conversions. And Patrick, he says, okay, Steve, I'm intrigued you are using Zoom. I'm a great fan. I also have Webinar Jam, but I find it very complicated. Are you going to do a comparison? Yep. All right. Yep. That's definitely in the works. I, I've got... I've got so much to compare now. <laughs> yes. I did before we did a comparison before in Webinar Palooza, but it was a one-off. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we've had to use Zoom really under fire, and it's been good. It's been a good learning experience. I love it. I mean, I I don't dislike any of these products. Get me wrong. I'm not such a big fan of go to webinar, but I have reasons for that. But <laughs> and, and if it was what all I had to use, I'd love it. It would still be. I would make it work. Trust me. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. And David says, you mentioned Zoom and Webinar Jam. Have you ever tried Crowdcast or Stealth Seminar? How do yes. they compare? Yes. Stealth Seminar, I was the very first webinar platform I used, and I philosophically have a real issue with it because Stealth Seminar is built from the beginning to create faux webinars. It's designed mm -hmm. for you to pre-record a webinar that looks live. It's their raison d'etre. It's what they teach. I find it abhorrent because I think if you put on a live webinar, or a, a webinar that you say is live, but is not live, you are lying to your community out of the gate. Even if you don't tell them that it's live and you you know don't ask, don't tell, you're still lying. You know that your intent is to show. And yes, live webinars convert better. There's a business case to be made for that. And the technology, both with EverWebinar and with Stealth Seminar, you can create the illusion that a webinar is live. But I think it is the worst thing that our community does. I, I, I just I can't say strongly enough how much I don't like it. Stealth Seminar had wonderful technical support. They have a fairly solid and robust platform. They've got good technology. I just think they're wrong-headed philosophically, so it's not a product that I, that I encourage people to use. Um, Crowdcast is really a great conferencing tool. I don't think Crowdcast has great integration with CRMs and some other aspects, but I know that Mike Stelzner has been using it, and I've been on it a few times watching as both a presenter and a guest, and it does a, it does a pretty darn good job uh, for broadcast-type webinars. You know, when you look at the, philosoph philo the philosophy, if you're doing a show as Stelzner is doing, they're not concerned with converting people and getting people to register and that sort of stuff. I think that Crowdcast is great. And it fills in a gap that we're, we've lost with a blab, say. Yeah. It does a better job of filling that in. Uh, whereas these other tools are more about this the, the business side of conversion, getting people signed up, ultimately getting them moving towards a business objective as opposed to just broadcasting a show. Great. Um, I think we've pretty much covered this. Howard had asked, why are you using Zoom? Yeah, just because we had it. Well, it's a good platform. And just because the reason that what motivated me to do it was the issues that we were having with uh, uh, the temporary issues that we were having with Webinar Jam, uh, that's it. And, and we were going to be using it for the course anyways. Yeah. David, um, this came earlier, so I think this was in response to your uh, overview of the past week. <laughs> He says, do you think it cost you sales? Did any pre-sales ask for refunds? And if so, how did you handle this? 
I think it cost us sales because we lost the, the metrics of the, this one course are the, our numbers are far lower than they normally would be. St it's still successful, but it's not where it should be. And it's not where I expected it to be. And normally because I've done this often enough, I'm, I think Jen will uh, say, I'm pretty usually bang on about what our numbers are going to be when we start, yeah. when we start a project yeah. and we're at about 60%. And I believe, I believe it's a combination. I'm also a big believer in momentum and other things. And, uh, once we fell behind and I started concentrating more on solving the technical issues than celebrating the opportunity of the course, I think that our messaging got a little bit off as we were selling it, as we were going. And so consequently, it was just, it was just kind of a perfect storm of a whole bunch of things uh, cascading. Uh, but we're going to get back on track. We've got another week. Uh, we're not going to be selling too much after, after today. We've got to do another webinar next week, which I'm going to be make a very sales-oriented webinar, which is going to be much more along the lines of a traditional sales webinar. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then if, if the numbers don't hit what I expect, um, we're just going to do the course, deliver the course, and then relaunch again right afterwards and get our feet back under us, look at what we could do better and relaunch it. Uh, my intention, we were going to be doing another course in about two or three months is, anyways. I was planning on that course actually being one on delivering um, how to develop online courses. But if we haven't met my objectives for this course, and I, because I think this course is tremendously valuable, and it's—I mm -hmm. know it's got a lot of value. We'll just redo it. I'm not going to. I'm not going to uh, let this not be the success that it should be. Yes, Susie. So, how would we do this if we don't have all the high tech equipment that you have? I don't really have as high tech equipment as you might think, Susie, and it depends on what your gear is. Uh, but we teach it. We teach in our. I mean, you can do a webinar pretty darn effectively. Uh, with just a, a, a good notebook computer. You don't even need a webcam. You know, you can do webinars, um, just slideshow webinars. Yeah. You have to have a good internet connection, uh, but it's not about the technology. Now, I invest in the technology because we do so much around video and stuff, and I think it's worth it, and the numbers will dictate when you invest. You can get going with a fairly lean system. Absolutely. Um, David is asking, when you were assessing webinar systems, did you look at professional systems such as Cisco WebEx? Yeah, Cisco WebEx is, I've, I've used it a lot as a, in different, um, in different like summits that I've been in. And, and it's yesterday's technology. That's the problem with that is it's not, it's not looking forward. You know, I, I'm looking for engagement. I'm looking for chat. I'm looking for the ability to integrate video. I'm looking for polls. I'm looking for flexibility. I'm looking for reliability. I'm looking for price. There's a lot of different things that I'm looking for. And WebEx, just as I evaluate it, it's just like, uh, do I, you know, we're not, it's just not here. It's, yeah. It's then. We don't want to be then. We want to be now. And they might have caught up a bit. I haven't looked at it recently. I mean, they might have, I, I used WebEx the other day for a call with a major client. And it was pretty, it was pretty decent. But it still kind of felt like, you know, put on a tie. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't strike me as the tie kind of guy. I have a tie. A tie. I wear a tie every day. A tie. <laughs> uh, on our first TV series, I wore a tie every show. Were you wearing one on the one that I saw? No, uh, maybe not. Don't worry about that. Let's not talk about that. Let's keep going. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll tell you guys later. Angela is asking, I understand why Zoom didn't like your recording to your computer while showing a recorded video. Was the only reason you were recording it yourself because you wanted to, the chat to show? I know Zoom doesn't show the chat. I was planning on just using Zoom recording without the chat. Yeah, so do a test before and see what the, see what the, what the recording looks like. Now, I didn't use their web recording. I used their local recording, and it was a fairly low, it was a smaller, fairly low resolution capture. So what we're doing right now, because we have a decent bandwidth, is I've got my notebook computer here, which I'll show you here. See, it's recording the webinar. And it's all in screen flow right now. So we're recording as we go. And then I'm going to take this full screen cast, which is pretty good quality, and I am going to output it and make that our pre-recorded video. And see the chats running there in the window. It's, it looks pretty good. Be happy with it. Very well. It's a workaround but it's a good workaround. It works. It's a workaround that works. It takes Susie. a little bit longer. Obviously, it's going to be three or four hours by the time it's ready to view, though, whereas the one that you do with Zoom is ready 
pretty much right away. Right. Just not as good. Susie, have you evaluated ease of participating on mobile or notebooks? Notebooks, yes. Mobile, we've got a lot of feedback uh, over the years. Uh, a lot of our people have been using it on, uh, on uh, iPads especially. Uh, but yeah, it, uh, all of these platforms resolve fairly well. I would say Zoom better because it's got the client, uh, but they all do fairly well in mobile now. And that's a big part. Anytime you use anything, you've got to consider the mobile aspect. I can't speak specifically as to which one is the strongest because it, it actually it's a good question we should send out. That's, that's a great mm -hmm. idea. Yeah. I'd like that's a really good I, idea. Let's do it. Let's let's do that with a, that'd be a good thing for us to do on webinar Wednesday is to talk about viewing webinars in mobile and to even send a poll out because we have enough people that take it in each time. Yeah. It's a great like idea. That. Thank you for that suggestion. Diane Darling, will you comment on Webinar Ninja? Thanks. Uh, Webinar Ninja is one of uh, a series of of really good technology companies that I you know, I've spoken to their founder use their product. Uh, it's based on WebRTC, which is, uh, which is a, a good solid platform. Gets a little bit expensive because you're paying for your feed individually. Um, and so um, it just gets a little bit pricey from that perspective. Uh, good integration with uh, CRMs. Um, it's really philosophically is as you set it up and as you register, if you, if you like, it. I find it a little bit thin in some of the, in some of the aspects when compared to webinar jam, say, as far as the integration goes. Uh, but it's, if it's a tool that you've invested in already, it's a solid tool with all of these tools. Once you've made the decision, unless it really gets catastrophically bad, I don't think that you should be worrying about the decision. It's like purchasing your CRM. Once we went to Infusionsoft, I don't know whether it was the best choice or not, but we're going to make it the best choice by knowing the tool and really delivering with the tool. Once you choose a tool, if you've chosen Webinar Ninja, just make it, just make sure you intimately know that tool inside and out, and then you work within it. Sometimes it's going to, sometimes you're the hammer and sometimes you're the nail. We send out an email. Mm -hmm. But with all of these technology companies, as they do a new release, they might have some new features, but some things might break. Sometimes it's going to work great. Sometimes it's going to be a little bit of a challenge. But if you know it, if you really, if you really intimately understand the tool and understand how it works with your community, it's your responsibility to make it work at that point. And it doesn't matter which tool you choose from that perspective. Okay. okay. I just want to let everybody know we have we still have 33 questions oh, wow. in, the, in the queue. So I know some of you are saying, did you get my question? Yes, I've gotten all the questions that have been submitted through the Q&A. If you're putting in them in chat, we may have to scroll back through and get them. But we will get to them, I promise. So don't. I don't see fear. Natalie's asking is the discount for Patreon members. Yes, there is. All of our Patreon members may get our courses for half price. So if you're interested in the course, uh, drop us a note in Patreon, and we'll send you the Patreon discount code. Yes. Um, Angela, so if I want to do a hybrid webinar, which platform do you recommend? Hybrid webinar? Well, um, I like Webinar Jam for it. it not in the next couple of weeks till they get everything solved. Um, and actually go to webinar works fairly well from that perspective as well. Uh, anyone that allows you to upload your video to the cloud and then serve it from a service like Vimeo or YouTube. Good. Susie is saying, do you offer something to purchase on every webinar? No, I don't. Well, we do a little call to action on every one of our webinar Wednesdays where we ask where we remind people that we're brought to, that you know we're supported so there's a little bit of business but it's not a hard sell what does it take about a minute and a half out of oh, the yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it, it, i'm not a hard sell guy you, what you saw today with the pitch that we made is about as much as we ever do and that's probably on 10 percent of our webinars yeah. we deliver we, we we i when we have a product to offer we like people to buy it but we're big on using webinars for building authority, building lists, building a relationship with our community, having them tell us what they want to know. All of the things that I talked about are things that we we walk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all that. Patrick, how can I source someone to ride shotgun on my webinars? You know, that's a great, here's, <laughs> and this wasn't, I'm not the sort of guy that says, if you buy the course, but I'm going to say, if you buy the course, here's the thing. <laughs> I think our Facebook group is going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have a bunch of other people that are doing webinars that are interested in success. And they're going to be, so I think that if you don't have somebody to ride shotgun as your second banana on your webinars, 
that we're going to be putting people together in the course is you're just going to post on the Facebook group. I'm doing a webinar next week. I need a producer who who's willing to do that quid pro quo. I'll do it for you. I think that's how we're going to, we're going to get people together. Did you just call me a banana? Second banana, not even Second first. Banana. Not even first. That's okay. Catherine, what does evergreen webinar mean? Evergreen webinar is when you take a webinar and you then repurpose it and keep presenting it. Now, Typically speaking, it, it, you present it as a webinar, and often the webinar software will incorporate incorporate, incorporate the chat <laughs> and everything else. People can make that look as though it's live, which is the thing we have issue with. Uh, so you have to choose with your evergreen webinars whether or not you want to have it uh, linear, where they can't jump ahead and they have to consume it as it is, or whether you're going to make it like a video. So when we upload to YouTube, that's why I like YouTube is you can jump ahead. I don't like locking people in so they have to watch it all the way through. And like this is going to be a long webinar by the time we're all yeah. set. Yeah. Um, how many people do we still have? We still have ninety-seven people, people and thirty-five questions. I think I answer a question and three more come in. That's good. We'll keep going. It's good. It's awesome. I love the engagement. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Susie, I'm launching a signature course that I would that I want to sell through evergreen webinars consistently. Will your course help me optimize and scale? Yep. Perfect. Um, That's in our sweet spot. Yes. Gregory, I think it would be helpful if Steve outlined the type of software and hardware and the cost to get started. You do do that. You have those available. Yeah. Uh, the software, I mean, you can spend anywhere from, uh, you know, $300 a year for a webinar or jam to, I think we spend nearly $200 a month for Zoom, right? So mm -hmm. you've got that range uh, for the two tools that we use a lot. Um, good computer, webcam, solid internet connection. It's it's not expensive to get in, uh, but then you've got all your systems in the back end. What are you using for your WordPress site? What's your registration system going to be? There's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts that I'm not going to go into right now. Um, we cover a lot of those. You know, we don't have anything that covers everything when we talk, talk about all the registration and all of the online stuff other than in the course itself. We don't really have a free resource. You'd have to cobble it together. Uh, but as far as the on-air presentation side, if you take a look at our course, uh, which is a free course called um, uh, How to Create a Video in Less Time Than Writing a Blog, mm -hmm. you go through all of the technology, which is almost identical. And I, um, the anatomy of a successful webinar, that... Yeah, oh yeah, we walked through it all in that. Is that a, that's not a free course though? That's I think thirty nine dollars. Nope, that's a free one. That's a free one. I, do that one. Yes, yes. And I I actually I pasted it. It's awesome sauce. <laughs> Hurry, get it before he charges. I should start charging. I'm pasting it in here now for you all. Okay, uh, David, how long do you suggest a promo video should be? I've heard don't do one that is longer than five minutes because people lose interest. In my interest, I can't cover anything in much in five minutes. Um, well, it depends what the promo is for. If it's like on a landing page to get people to register, yeah, five minutes is going to be too long. Uh, if it's a video that you're seeding out there as a lead into your course, like if you're doing a, like a three-part series where you're talking about, you know, you're, you're basically taking what we've covered in this webinar now and you're breaking it into three 30-minute videos, it's fine. Mm -hmm. It depends on the intent. If people are coming to it when they've got something else to do, like as they're registering, yeah, five, five minutes or longer is going to be way too long. If it's something that you're going to send them, that they're going to parcel out time to consume, then you can be as long as you need to be. Perfect. David, what program do you use to do an evergreen webinar to make people think it's live? Well, Stealth Seminar will do that. Ever, ever Webinar, which is part of Webinar Jam, uh, which is a sister a companion product, is a, one of the most popular, and they will do it. Okay, oh, this one, know. this one we may have just answered by providing that link to the anatomy of a successful webinar. But I'll see if you have anything to add. Bill's asking, will you discuss the resources that are required for the webinar, like recording? What kind of computing power do you need for the recording? Yeah, we cover that pretty well in the, the anatomy of a successful webinar. I think. Yeah. Doug. More is better. More is better, yes. Doug, are you going to discuss what you've recently learned about the webinar platforms? I know Webinar Jam has let you down lately, and now you're on Zoom. Yeah, yeah. We, I, I discussed it a little bit earlier in this webinar, if you joined late, I, I, some of the things. And I, and I want to make sure that I emphasize, I'm not, I don't think that, we haven't made a permanent change. 
we're going to use both these platforms mm -hmm. uh, because this is our profession. We do webinars and I have to know all the tools anyways. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, and, and I still think they're viable and, and, and depending on what your needs are, I would recommend one or the other, uh, to you. I, I still think they all have a space. Uh, but we definitely cover that in the course and uh, I'm sure I'll be covering it in some sort of video or some sort of webinar coming up. I don't have time to go into detail right now I, and I don't like pushing <laughs> you off to the course, but we definitely, you can also get an awful, an awful good, a very good idea of these tools, at least the webinar jam. Zoom, um, a few others. I'm trying to remember which other ones we did a really solid job of. In a in a little mini course we have called Webinar Palooza, where we tested out eight webinars. We didn't get through all eight. They didn't all work, but it kind of in, in the hierarchy, the, the the most popular ones we get it a really good test of. Hmm. Bob, do you have experience with Bright Talk webinar platform? No. Fred, you keep talking about Infusionsoft. We use Insightly. Are they just as good? Well, Insightly is, I mean, whatever you use, you use. Uh, as long as Insightly has the ability to, and I looked at it, I can remember it was a nice, very lean CRM. It wasn't as designed on email marketing as we needed. It was more designed on sales, I believe, CRM. But as long as you have the ability to be able to mark and, you know, to tag or to create lists, um, you're going to be okay. Looking for its integration with the webinar platform, you're going to have to take a look at yourself. Insightly isn't one that I that I can say right off the top of my mind that I know works. I can't guarantee it. Uh, so you might have to do some research on that. Okay. Carol, is Zoom working on the recorded playback problem that you have been describing? No. No, they, they I had a conversation, well, at least I can't say for sure, but in talking to their techs of people uh, about my biggest concerns, which was the, I would love for them to upgrade the video presentation, the hybrid side, mm -hmm. just they're happy with sharing desktop. They're saying, no, that's the way that we do it. Um, in the recorded side, they made a change to their pricing for web recording, which I think is still a little userous, uh, but it doesn't sound like they're, it doesn't sound like it's a big part of their, of their equation either. So that's why we work on figuring out a workaround. All right. Carol, does Zoom work with ConvertKit? Uh, it will. I'm not too sure how deep the integration is. Zoom doesn't have as deep an integration with these tools as does Webinar Jam and a few of the other tools. Uh, but you can certainly make it work with it. It'll, you know, the way even the way that we're doing it, which is API integrations going out, you'll be um, um, HTTP post. You'll be able to do that stuff. Okay. And anonymous attendee asked, um, and we covered this one a little bit, but they said, you mentioned that you didn't love Zoom from a recording standpoint. So what are you doing to record this webinar so that you can make it evergreen? So it is going to be a video as opposed to an interactive webinar recording. And I'm recording it using ScreenFlow on a Mac, which is sitting right next to me right now. And I have, I've, I've logged in as a participant there. It's recording it. As soon as it's done, I will then use my internal network to move it over to my editing system. I will edit it, output it, post it to YouTube, and that's what I'm going to be sharing. Okay. And I, I don't know if it's A I don't think that's optimal, by the way, but it's acceptable. Acceptable. For Steve. I don't know if this A Ave or Avi, I don't want to pronounce, I, sorry if I messed up your name, but they are asking, I don't believe I'm ready for Infusionsoft. Which segment's better, MailChimp, AWeber, or something else? I used AWeber. Um... I like MailChimp better, but I think I'd like MailChimp better because I used AWeber. I think if I used MailChimp, I'd probably say I like AWeber better. I think that they're all intermediate steps. I like AWeber better. Okay. I See, I, there's a lot of things I don't like about AWeber. So I, yeah. I wouldn't want to recommend. Yeah. Ask April. April also. Just drop us an email. April might have a recommendation. April, but I think yeah. you're fine with either. MailChimp. I've heard a lot of criticism lately about MailChimp, but I, I think MailChimp because MailChimp segments your lists better. AWeber charges you, if you've got people on two lists, they charge you twice. It drives me nuts. And I know it's mm -hmm. only two lists, but it drives me crazy. <laughs> MailChimp allows you to properly segment your list. I think it sets you up better for the, for the future. I'm going to say MailChimp. Okay. Steve says MailChimp. Uh, Carol says next Zoom. Suggest, oh. On the next Zoom, suggest everyone select everyone. I accidentally selected all panelists and being called you. Call me Carol, and maybe you'll answer my Zoom questions. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the feedback, Carol. Uh, Christi 
Chris, oh, Christian, I think it's just spelled different. Sorry if I annihilated that one too. Disable HIDPI uh, on your Mac. It'll help Zoom when you're sharing the screen and playing a video. Switch ResX can do it for you with a single click and sends exactly the same size as your shared window desktop. I usually share 1080, 1920 by 1080. Now they say they only output 720. Could you copy that? I, I've got to dive into that. I don't even know what he's talking about. I got to do some research. Okay. Sounds yeah. like you should be doing a webinar. Can you copy that and email it to me or just add it to, um, can you copy the text? It's not letting me copy it, but it will be in the chat. Um, let me so, just screenshot yeah. it real quick. Yeah. Drop it, drop it in Slack for me. I want to, I want to go through that. Okay. That's, I screenshot Sounds like somebody that. knows what they're talking about. Yeah. More than I did. Woo. Okay. Peggy again, got, got the change to the select all panels and attendees. Thanks. Still coming up as me. Yeah, Peggy, when you when you chat or comment in there, it'll say from me. That's what you see, but we actually see your name. Like if when I'm commenting to you guys, I see it says from me. It doesn't say from Jen. So it's just letting you know that that is from you. It's not what we are actually seeing. Um, Susie, have you looked at blue jeans? No, it's, it's a little pricey for me. Uh, I know some of the, the some of the people have used it. Uh, Joel Com was using it for a few things. It's just a little too expensive for me to consider it for our for, at our level. It's a corporate tool. All right, let's see. It looks duplicate. awesome. Diane, darling, if live performs best, should I not create an evergreen one? No. Well. <laughs> I think leveraging your content, make it sure you leverage. Live is going to perform best, but you can't do it live all the time. And people, and, and if if your content is a valuable and 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 it still converts people to whatever your goals are in a recorded me method, use that. You got to. The world's not always going to be perfect. Time zones alone, the not the biggest complaint we get in criticism. We actually have people pissed off at us. Because we do our webinars at 10 a.m. Pacific. So that's the time it works for me. That's when I'm at my best. And, you know, our, our poor people in England are eight hours later. It's dinner time for them. Steve, could you do a webinar sometime other than when I'm feeding the kids? I'm sorry. I wish I could. But, you know, I, and I, could be ch I could be chasing my tail all the time. For those people, that's who recorded webinars for. For the people in Australia, New Zealand, you know, it's a different day and it's three in the morning. That's who it's for. And, and uh, you know, so you, I think it helps overcome a lot of those issues. Yeah. Again, not optimal, but we work with what we can. Uh, Greg, when are the details about winning at webinars course going to be sent to those who purchased? You'll get everything. It'll, we'll send you something this week, but Monday, all of the details will be there. We'll send out, we should send out an email actually sooner, uh, which is going to be the, the revised dates or uh, the dates so you can put them in your calendar. So actually we'll get that done this weekend before I go. I've got a conference I'm speaking at next week, so I'll get that done this weekend. Okay. Carol, what do you use to send your send people your videos via email as a follow-up, for instance, or an opt-in? Well, with we send them as a YouTube link for the most part. Um, so within Infusionsoft, we can add a video link. It, it impacts, unfortunately, including video, if you would like to include a, a video, uh, it Im impacts your deliverability. And we've got this balancing act with delivering rich content and making sure that we're deliverable through email servers and stuff like that. So typically what we do is Infusionsoft does allow, it pulls the splash page and it'll, it creates a, a link straight to the YouTube play page. So typically speaking, when we share videos, we share them within, uh, we use the, uh, a, a YouTube link within Infusionsoft. All right. I don't know if that helped your question or not. <laughs> uh, David, you mentioned that you use Webinar Wednesday to build your list. How do you build? Don't you need to have their email already to invite them to the webinar? Well, no, because you create, you, you cross promote. So we do blog posts, we post to Facebook, we are constantly promoting in Twitter. So we're using social networks to expand. Plus we're inviting people to share and we could be doing a better job of that. Something that we're going to increase. As a matter of fact, in the very near future, we're going to be adding a thank you page, which is going to encourage you to share with your friends that might be interested in the same topic. We get a lot of sharing after the webinar. Here's one of the things we do valuable webinar, valuable content. Case in point last week. 
we did a webinar, which wasn't a lot of fun, but it was about what happens to your social networks after you die. And what do, what should you be doing now to make things easier to transition for your loved ones when you pass with things like your Facebook and Instagram and all those sorts of things. The number of people that wrote us afterwards and saying, this was fantastic. Can I share this with so-and-so, so-and-so with my friends? That's this kind of viral sharing. If you create great content that's very shareable, then people will share it. Put mechanisms in place to encourage them to share it. Start the ball rolling in places like Facebook. That's where the growth comes. The, the viral growth. You can also pay for traffic, right? We can pay and invest mm -hmm. in it if you choose. Once, you're, once your business is up and running, I know that the number of people that I have signed up for Infusionsoft, if I look at the number at the start of the year, I pretty much know what I'm going to make at the end of the year mm -hmm. because it, the dollars work every year based on the size of that list. So let's say it's $4 per person that you're going to earn off of your courses. That means that you can acquire new people at $3 a person on Facebook. If you can run ads, you're going to be making a dollar a person on those new people if you look at big picture. So as your business grows, there's other opportunities to invest. I'm not big on paid traffic. I don't love doing paid traffic. I prefer organic, uh, but both are going to work. Um, and I see a comment just came through from Robert. He says, wish my one simple question could have been answered. Robert, it is on the list. Like I said, we're going through as fast as we can um, and we will get that answered for you. Um, Susie's asking, don't you also have a video course and can I get that info? Yes, it's screencasting made easy. If you go to autotech.com uh, and you click on courses, the screencasting course info is there. We do. I've got it here too to input. Um, Greg, are you, oh, or Carol, are you not answering my questions because I'm stuck on you? No, I think we got your questions, Carol. People were getting a little antsy. Uh, Greg, when are the details about winning? Nope, that's a duplicate. Hold on. Let's keep going here. Uh, another duplicate. In order to do a test, should it be with five people, 20, just one extra person? Thanks, says I Diane. I, I, let, I typically do draft uh, April or Jen when we're testing, but I'll do them by myself just to my notebook as well. Perfect. You don't need a lot. You got to uh, know where all the switches are. You got to see how it resolves. Yeah. Greg, that this is all geared to making an income. My focus, this is all geared to making an income. My focus is more training, educational and broadcasting information to select groups. So growing the list is not focused, but what would be the best tool of these mentioned? So I think what webinar tool, if he's not focused on growing his list, is that my understanding that correct? If you're not focused on growing your list, you have lots of opportunities in other areas as well. So any of these tools is going to serve you well, but I would do an awful lot more live and you can schedule live. So say use YouTube live and then promote when you're going to be doing it on YouTube live. And so you can do it at far less money, like without spending all the money on this. If, if, if the administrative back end is not important to you, then you can use just social networking to grow. I would say, I mean, I, I still think that you ultimately should be growing your list, but you know, th that, that's an option for you. But all of the tools will work from that perspective. Since you're not going to be making money off it, I would say Webinar Jam because it's the least expensive if I had to pick one. Okay. Gordon, what is the difference between webinars and screencasts? Well, webinars are when we're broadcasting. Screencasts are when we're capturing the screen and we're using it to create a video. So we'll use screencasts within webinars. Uh, so, but it's screencast is like, if you go to my YouTube channel, all of our videos are screencasts. I've captured the, I've used, I mean, I'm using the screen as a, as a participant, as a character within whatever video I'm making. Okay. Robert, can you explain the Patreon connection and how it helps to integrate your services? Well, Patreon for us is, is a community building. What it does is it allows people who like our content and, and want to support us. It allows, and, and, and want to encourage us to do, uh, not revenue centric content. For example, the webinar we did last week on uh, after your death, uh, what happens to your social networks, there's no way we were going to make money off that. So consequently, uh, because we have Patreon, which is crowdfunding, people who like the content, like the education that we provide, give us $10 a month and they say, keep making great content like that. We consume it. We like it. So it's basically like a subscription, but they're supporting us as a community member. And then in return, we give them access to some additional content. Ant, what are your opinions of Demio? I've seen several people have webinar jam problems and I'm very impressed with Demio. Demio is a very impressive product. It's one that I've, that I've taken a good hard look at. And I think, I think they're really on the right track. 
Natalie, are you an affiliate for Webinar Jam? I am. And actually, yeah, if, if you're interested in purchasing it and you are willing to use my affiliate link, uh, let me know and I'll send that to you. It's, I, I am affiliate on very few products, but they're all products that I do use and I pay for myself. So Webinar Jam is one. Fred said he'd become second banana for Steve. You have to ask first banana. She was, she's willing to step aside. Nope. Or no, you called me second banana. You are. I guess Shannon's first banana. Yeah. I Shannon's first that. banana. She will not be impressed. <laughs> David, Jen, this is a repeat from chat. If you're counseling and new venture, would you suggest two platforms like webinar jam and zoom or simply pick one and make it work? If you're counseling, did he say? Yeah, if you're counseling, maybe researching, maybe it's what he. Okay, um, depending on your need, if, if, if your lead is list building, sales, internet marketing, webinar jam. If you're coaching, consulting, small group, some webinar stuff, Zoom. In between, I mean, you'll make decisions in other cases. I wouldn't start with two platforms. There's no way, I'd start with one. Yeah. And get comfortable with one. And then if you outgrow one, that's fine. But I would start with one. If I had to choose, if it sounds like to me like you're, you know, in, you said counseling, if, if you're like doing meeting type stuff, Zoom has more flexibility as far as types of calls that we have. Yeah. Okay. Anonymous attendee. I would love to learn from you. What? what? I'd love to learn from you why you're not using breakout rooms since you're saying that community engagement and conversion is key. Thank you so much. I make great experiences with it. I've never used a breakout room. It's something that we should research. I don't know anything about them. Yeah. We're so new to Zoom. Zoom, you can do that, I believe. And so we're, I think we're so new to Zoom. We will get there, but for this launch, we weren't there. <laughs> uh, Natalie, will you be releasing those six modules all at once or one at a time? The, the, the six consecutive weeks. And Natalie has, she did purchase. So thank yeah. you, Natalie. Thank you so much. Uh, Christoph, I would love to learn from you. Oh, duplicate. Uh, duplicate. We're two hours into this. Yeah. We have seven more questions. Good. Thanks for people for being so patient. Great. Yeah. I think Saturday webinars. This is amazing. Especially when you don't sleep through them. <clears throat> A couple Chris, of, keep going. Last year, <laughs> the webinar, she was supposed to be on with me on a Saturday. It was like an 8 a.m. webinar. and It was. We were trying We were trying to, yes, go on. Yeah. Okay. Christian, you can use Zapier to integrate almost anything with Zoom. I integrate ActiveCampaign and my WordPress site too, and it works perfectly. Yeah. Zapier is a great workaround. I, I'd prefer that they made it native, but Zapier mm -hmm. is a wonderful workaround. Sounds like Christoph is a, is it Christian or Christoph? It sounds like he's a pretty technically competent dude. Yes. Yes. Robert, I guess the question about the Patreon value to a webinar is not valid oh, because you skipped it. We got to it, Robert. It just took us a little bit. I'm sorry. Uh, David, Jen. I did answer that. I did answer. You did. You did. It just, I think people were a little antsy to get their questions answered. Uh, David, Jen, I can send you an email with the copy of the question, disabling the HIDPI, where do you want it? Okay, info uh, at dottotech. Yep, info at dottotech.com would be great. I did also screenshot it and I will send that to you, Steve. Thank you, thank you, David. Um, thank you, Steve and Jen. Sound like we'll start in MailChimp. Jim, you pronounced my name, or Jen, you pronounced my name correctly. Yay, long A. My nickname long is, yeah. yes, rhymes with Dave. So Ave, but pronouncing the A as is and have uh, is okay. No worries. Thank you. Uh, Vance had to leave. Sorry you had to leave, Vance. Thank you for spending two hours with us. Uh, Fred, could Patreon be a good way to make money offering free courses, or should you just charge for the course? You know, Patreon is takes momentum. I think Patreon is when you've got a community large enough that you create a little bit of critical mass and it's got a wonderful feeling to it. But if I was just beginning, I would start with a simple relationship because we have to explain what Patreon is as well as sell the course. So there's, uh, there's a couple of extra touch points. When you have as much content as what we have right now, I think it's the, the, it makes more sense. But right at the beginning, I would charge for a course and I would use Thinkific to build it all which keeps everything all in one small package 
where they've got the payment system, they've got the delivery system, it builds your landing page, builds your opt-ins. It's That is the way to go. And if you haven't taken our starting, uh, building your first online course course, that's the way to begin. Yeah. Peggy, will the Q&A be available in the replay? Yeah, yes, it's all it being will. recorded right now. It's going to be a big ass video. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to want to fast forward to the end, Peggy. <laughs> and and uh, can we have the link to the course again, please? I have just put it in there for you. So we have okay. reached the end of the Q&A list. 91 questions answered. That's a record. It was a good idea doing the webinar today. Yes, it was. Good idea, Steve. You're genius. <laughs> yeah. Having a two weeks of catastrophes has to have some payoff. Yes. <laughs> hey, folks. Uh, Jen, thanks for hanging in. For all of you that uh, that stayed on with us, thank you so much. Will the course cover the tech webcam? Yes. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll show you how to set it up. We even get into the little minutiae, like how do you white balance? See? Watch this. Just a, an idea. This is what my camera would look like if it wasn't set up right. Ooh. That's what the camera would look like normally. This is what it looks like after you've taken our course. <laughs> Much better. And lighting. Yeah, that's Much exactly better. Right. Lighting and we use a uh, we use a color correction. We we will we'll show you how to do all those little things. Yes. It's little things. It's some big things and lots of little things. There are a few here in uh the chat, someone's asking if you use Optimize Press only for landing pages or for website and membership sites as well. We don't use the membership. I, I stopped using membership sites. We've, we've replaced that all with Patreon. I used Optimize Press as a membership site. Didn't love it for that, but I don't like any membership sites. I think they're really cumbersome. We use Optimize Press for our sales and landing pages, opt-in pages only. Okay, I, th I hope we got them off. If I missed one, you guys, I am so sorry. There was a lot in here. Well, you know what? We're going to be sending you out an email. Reply to the email if, with questions if they weren't answered. And we'll Perfect. Okay? Perfect. So with that, it's two hours uh, still with 75, 75 people or so in the room. That's oh, awesome. I appreciate you guys staying with us. I hope you've learned a lot. Those of you who are new to our community, welcome aboard. Those of you that decided that the course is, is for you, we are so looking forward. How do you sign up, Jennifer? Just drop that in. Jen will drop you the email in or the uh, link in. Yep. The link here one more time. Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a great ride. You guys are gonna be the first cohort going through the course, and so it's uh, it's it's gonna be I'm gonna be more involved than I uh, I'm just I'm chomping at the bit ready to go. I just keep every day I keep adding new things and writing new pieces because that's the nature of a live when we're delivering it live is like as I talked about agile deployment we keep adding more things and every webinar we do like this we get additional ideas as well. Mm -hmm. With that I'm gonna stop rambling. Jen, thank you. Go enjoy the day with your kids. I will. I will. Uh, Thank the rest you. Of you. Enjoy your weekend wherever you happen to be. Uh, Till next time, I'm Steve Dotto. Have fun storming a castle. <laughs>